Good morning, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Vermont Law School. My name is Maggie Galka, and I'm one of the many student organizers of today's conference, bridging the gap between the promise and the reality of environmental justice. Um, I want to welcome you to South Royalton and to Vermont Law School, where our motto is law for the community and the world. And I can't think of another topic that fits that motto more than environmental justice. So we're really excited that you've joined us today. I just have a couple of things to let you know that are sort of housekeeping related. So the first is that this event is being live streamed. So if that is something that you're concerned about, please see me or see Sherry, um, but also know that the camera is over there so you can get yourself out of the shot if that's something that worries you. Um, the second thing to know is that while there are panels going on in here, we're going to have the doors closed, but there is a door all the way in this corner over here that you can use to get out um, without having to use the loud doors. Um, we also have a number of art installations at the conference today. One of our artists is here. Her name is Michelle Sales. Um, she did the art that's displayed above and also in this hallway between this building and the library. So if you have some downtime, I encourage you to go take a look. There's also some fifth grade artists that did their interpretations of environmental justice and their work is out on the chalkboard. And then lastly, a artist named Richard Hankston did a few pieces that are displayed um, in front. So please feel free to take a look at those. Um, and then lastly, if you are a student in this room that is a volunteer for this conference or one of the student facilitators, I'd like you to stand up and be recognized now at the beginning of the conference. <laughs> Thank you. I personally want to thank these people because without them, this conference really wouldn't be a reality. And there's also about 10 more of them running around doing things. So you can thank them as you see them. Um, and that's all that I have. I hope that you enjoy the day. And I will introduce Sherry White. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Maggie and I started this with a big, wide, wild dream. And the dream has been met today. We had no idea that we'd have this much enthusiasm. We checked last night, and we had 246 people registered for this conference today. We have people from as far away as Puerto Rico, one of our speakers, so we have a plethora of speakers here, and we ask you to take advantage of the nine different breakout sessions that are going to be going on during the day. I haven't figured out how to cut myself into about six pieces, because that's how many I want to go to today, so I'm going to be running around and probably grabbing a little bit of a few of those. But without further ado, um, I want to bring our dean forward, Dean Mark Mahali, who is going to give the welcome this morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Mahali. I'm the dean. Uh, I particularly want to welcome those of you who've uh, come from all over the country. Uh, we do have four seasons in Vermont, <laughs> and um, despite climate change, which is causing us to have a little more rain and ice than we would like in the winter, we did manage to arrange for you uh, some, some actual winter weather, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, I, I also, for those of you who are not members of the Vermont community, you may be a little surprised when you saw the number of people standing up just a minute ago. This conference, like all of our key conferences, is, has been conceived and designed and run by the students here. And that, and, and, and I particularly want to sh thank Sherry White and Maggie Galka for all the work they did, but everybody else as well. And, and that is, that is appro it is appropriate that the conference be conceived and designed and run by the students because 
Um, the people who find their way to Vermont Law School are people who do not, um, they don't see themselves as just fitting in to the status quo, they see themselves as agents for changing the status quo. And that, that is what makes this place what it is, and it's why it's, it's part of the genesis of this conference, and it's why I feel really delighted that this conference is here, it's appropriate, and we, we hope to learn from all of the speakers, the wonderful national speakers and the community advocates who are here together. Um, it means a great deal to us that you are here. I, 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 I have to say that um, there are times when many of us here are feeling that the future uh, has some, shall I say, dark elements to it. Um, uh, obviously, um, climate change isn't going to get better in the near future. It's going to get worse. There are going to be more and greater impacts. And uh, as those occur, um, there will be an increasing tendency and a rise of people with those tendencies to take advantage of the fear that occurs, to play on the worst in people, and to create an atmosphere in which it is difficult to uh, create change. So, and uh, I think that's already begun and it isn't going to get better. It's going to be more intense, um, which to me, only highlights the need for those of us who want to address climate change and do something about it and make a difference to work together, gather energy, uh, gird our loins and get out there and make a difference and do something. And I think that a conference like this is essential for that because this is not a conference to discuss academic issues in the sense of just investigating, well, what's happening? We all know what's happening. The question is what to do about it. And a conference like this is a chance for you all to increase your energy, get to know each other if you don't know each other, and hopefully leave with some added energy and added ideas. Um, it's it's also a chance for us to learn from you, a chance for us to gather new ideas. This school is committed to addressing climate justice and to addressing environmental justice, to doing something about it. Uh, we can't just sort of be a purely academic in, this, in, in that sense institution. We're an institution filled with people who want to act as well. And we look forward to listening to a distinguished group of panelists and the discussion to thinking about what we can add to our, all, all, our, our existing program uh, to, address, to address that issue. Um, and I think what's part of what's happening is we're at a really key time Across the board, all of those that's engaged in the um, environmental endeavor have known for years that climate change is gonna change everything. It's gonna change the way we think. It's gonna change the way we think about the environment. It's changing the way we teach. But it's also changing environmental justice. You know what, in other words, environmental justice is at a pivotal point now where it's moving from a base that addressed issues of the location of unwanted land uses in environmental communities, in, in uh, uh, economically depressed in communities and communities of color because that's where they could be put. And its origins were in resistance to that. And now it's moving into being into a broader sphere because it isn't the wealthiest people who are most impacted immediately by the crises of climate change. It's, it tends to impact communities of color and poorer communities first. Certainly we saw that in New Orleans. We're seeing that in migrations. We're seeing that in that Syria is a climate war in many respects and it's just the beginning. So I think that the conference like this and the efforts of all of you that you are making to move climate justice 
and environmental justice are going to move into a pivotal, absolutely pivotal role in this effort to try to save ourselves and prove that the, the human endeavor is worth saving. So I welcome you all here. I'm delighted you're here. And uh, Sherry, you want to take it from here? Thank you very much. Without further ado, I want to bring forward the first panel of the morning. Uh, that panel is Quentin Pear, who is um, a former DOJ employee, now retired and teaching at Howard University Law School. Charles Lee, who we consider the mastermind, the pioneer of environmental justice, who wrote the report that many of you may be familiar with, Toxic Waste and Race in the US. Um, we have Richard Moore, who is another pioneer in the movement who was instrumental in organizing the First People's Co Conference of Color in 1991. Um, and we have from Beverage and Diamond, Ben Wilson was not able to meet us, but he has sent a very worthy replacement, Randy Hyman, who will also be a part of that panel. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Quentin, who's going to moderate this panel. Water up here. There was a, <laughs> last night. I thought I heard this whispers about. Good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you very much <clears throat> for coming this morning. Um, <clears throat> some of you heard me t talk about or trying to pump up the crowd last night about how important this conference is. Um, f when I was in here in January for Martin Luther King, you might have heard me say that. Environmental justice is the civil rights of the 21st century. Something that I personally believe in. Um, and when we uh, went to Howard University to bring uh, a whole course on environmental justice, we told the dean that. And that was over uh, 15 years ago. And they've been very good in supporting that. Um, I also say that for lawyers, over the next, for the foreseeable future. If you don't know anything about environmental justice, you do so to your own professional peril. It is going to touch everything we do in the foreseeable future. Um, today we managed to bring some of the top people nationally across the country to come speak to you. And I said last night uh, that uh, you'll never have a gathering like this again, and I mean it. Um, when I, uh, particularly working with Sherry and Maggie and the, and the other students, um, trying to get people like uh, Charles, uh, Richard, and um, um, what's his name? Randy. <laughs> <laughs> um, told them about, I um, said, you know, you got to come see the students up at Vermont Law. It's one thing for um, student faculty to invite you, but the students want this to happen, and the students are making this. And I'm very pleased that you turned out <laughs> to um, impress them as well. But I do hope you take advantage of their presence and speak to them individually and hear what they have to say. Um, Charles Lee, who is my mentor immediately, um, as many of you know, is the author of Toxic Waste and Race in 1987 when he's with the United Church of Christ. The seminal work, I'd say, on environmental justice uh, write that down. You don't really have to. You can go Google it. Um, uh, before that, there was the Government and Accounting Office uh, did a study in 1982 on the Southeast United States. The correlation between the demographics of the population and the siting of these toxic waste sites. And they found three out of four of the most toxic substance sites in America were in communities of color and in poor communities. And the single greatest determining factor where you will find these is race, not income. That's a distant second. <coughs> but it was Charles and his confederate or assistant, Vernice Miller-Travis, that went into the database and said, you know, let's take this nationally. 
because before the first study was just the Southeast United States, which is where the, the greatest uh, um, number of African Americans lived. This is back in the 70s. But Charles said, well, you know, let's kind of test this out nationally. And what did they find in every state in the country? Three out of four of these sites in community of color and in poor communities. And that race, again, was the determining factor, income at distant second. And it's because of Charles's work that there was great discussion across academia, and he's been involved in developing not only theories, but programs, and pushing the environmental justice uh, envelope. And I've been indebted to him ever since because of what I have learned. I'm not going to say sitting at his knee, but maybe at his right hand. Um, and then there's Richard Moore. Richard Moore is the uh, uh, current um, chair of the National Environmental Justice, um, what's the rest of it? National Environmental Advisory Justice Committee. Advisory Committee. Don't get old. <laughs> um, which is a creature of EPA, but it, um, the, um, uh, this is not his first go, uh, rodeo. He was only supposed to serve one term, but they found it necessary to bring him back because Richard is uh, uniquely qualified. He's, he is a, a, a rabid radical uh, as far as bringing uh, critique to the system, and, but he's also someone who brings people together across the whole spectrum of environmental justice. Um, talking to people in government at the Department of Justice, EPA, White House, down to county and local governments. But more importantly, he represents the heart and soul of the grassroots communities. And my other mentor, um, and he was there at the beginning of the environmental justice movement. And then there's Randy um, Haven, who um, I only pretended to forget his name, but I don't want to get in trouble. Randy is with the law firm of <coughs> uh, Beverage and Diamond, one of the preeminent environmental law firms in the country and, uh, and litigating law firms. Um, he um, and I have uh, kind of done a dog and pony show on, uh, on, on these issues, but Randy's particular point of view is the importance of business. His firm has a Rolodex like this of the Fortune 500, and he and Ben Wilson, who you heard referenced earlier, uh, who teaches environmental law at Howard with me, um, have incorporated the principles of environmental justice into their practice and advise their, their um, corporate clients of the importance. And so it is the antithesis of all lawyers who represent grassroots communities, or all the only good lawyers, and all lawyers who represent business are the enemy. Um, ain't nothing wrong with making money, folks, and God bless, I hope some of you go there and, and make a whole lot of it. But I expect that you, when you bring this, being agents of change, you will take the principles of environmental justice with you and make sure the people that you work for or who work for you understand that you can make all the money you want in this country, but that does not give you license to kill. That's a little too dramatic, but you get my point. Um, that these communities suffer. Um, it's also important for me to, to, to stress the point that many of my students have a struggle understanding that you have to suss out the difference between environmentalism and environmental justice. It is not the same thing. They intersect and they're entwined. Environmental justice is about people. Okay, now you can't, you can't take care of people unless you take care of your environment. But to understand the in nature of environmental justice, you have to study and how to separate these issues out. If you can't suss it out from here and these people, you need to go down to Wall Street and try to make some money in the stock market. Um, we've brought to you here today some people, and not only this panel, to, throughout the day, I think Maggie or Sherry helped me out on this, we've got like 31 uh, people uh, across the various disciplines who are the tops in their field. Um, thank, 
Thank you. Um, it's <clears throat> important that they were attracted to come to Vermont law. I knew about Vermont law long before I came up. I've had a couple of students that have come to Howard to take my class. But when I was invited by Jean Jefferson to come up to do the, uh, the um, presentation on uh, Martin Luther King uh, uh, birthday or celebration, I said I'd get a chance to come and see for myself because I hadn't heard anything about Vermont law and environmental justice. Highly noted as an environmental law school, but where's the environmental justice at the law school? But I've come to find the clinic that's being developed. Um, the faculty is very supportive and the students overwhelmingly are the reasons why we have this conference today and have put this together. So, and, and, when, and when I went back and told my colleagues this, they said, yeah, we're coming. So, um, no sleeping, okay. Um, uh, but I think that you, we were gonna, we're gonna try to have some time at the end for Q and A. Sherry has promised to keep us all on time tracks. Lots of luck with that. And I'm going to start off by turning it over to, and they'll tell you more about their personal credentials as they go along, I guess. But let's start off with Charles Lee. Great. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And um, uh, thank you uh, so much for um, inviting me here today. I want to thank uh, Dean McCauley and and uh, Maggie Golka and um, Sherry White and all the students um, who um, uh, organized this. And, um, you know, um, I was talking with Dean Mears um, uh, yesterday and some of the students, and I had the sense of this incredible uh, energy and passion uh, that um, went into uh, organize, organizing this uh, conference. But I also, um, got this real sense of the institutional commitment and support for, um, for the issue and for the activities of the students. And so, um, you know, um, it was, uh, I was very excited to come up here and uh, yesterday, and I'm sure today is gonna really kind of um, uh, uh, make me even more excited. And, um, and um, I do wanna begin by um, giving a disclaimer uh, you know, I do currently work for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and I am here uh, speaking in a personal capacity. Um, a lot of the things I um, am going to talk about uh, span um, a time and a, and, a, and a body of work that uh, was done uh, before I went to EPA, um, and, um, and, and so therefore, you know, I thought it would be wise to uh, speak from that perspective. Um, or, and, uh, and I want to make it clear that, um, you know, the views I'm going to uh, present are not necessarily the views of uh, U.S. EPA or the, or, or the federal agencies. Um, so um, I uh, want to give a little bit of background to this talk. Uh, um, and, um, and last year, uh, sometime, I was asked to speak to uh, a, a group of Asian American Pacific Islander interns in Washington, D.C. And, um, and I realized, uh, and I've been asked, and they asked me to talk about, you know, history, environmental justice, my, my parts in that, and, 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 uh, and I used to always give it chronologically, you know, what happened in the 80s, what happened in the 90s, actually what happened in the 70s, what happened in the 80s what happened in the 90s and so on and so forth. And then I realized that, um, you know, if you start to look at the uh, iconic events that shape environmental justice, and I'm gonna go into them, you can actually look 30 years hence, and you can see a trajectory of development for these that, you know, really are uh, uh, quite remarkable in terms of the, um, the, uh, the significant the impact they've had. Um, and so, um, you know, what I'm going to talk about today is actually maybe um, my wife has been t keep uh, bugging me to, you know, write my book, right? So, um, you know, this actually will be part of uh, the first chapter of that book. And, um, and, uh, and so, um, and, and um, 
Uh, and uh, I would really like to uh, get your feedback on that. And uh, th I mean, there's a lot of other key things that I won't be able to present that are uh, going to be important part of a, an important overview of uh, environmental justice. So, uh, so that's probably like a good, um, uh, you know, setup for this. And as you know, the title of this uh, talk is uh, "Arcs of History in Environmental Justice." And so this is the first slide, and of course you, everyone knows where that quote comes from, right? Martin Luther King said that, uh, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And President Obama, you know, kind of ample, I'll talk to that when he said that, um, you know, um, you know uh, um, it isn't uh, poss necessarily possible to always bend history the way we want to. Uh, but, you know, um, the, uh, the arc uh, is definitely a bend towards justice. And then he said that it's very important to understand that each of us has a role in shaping that arc. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, uh, and so those are represented in the words that's up on the, um, on, on the slide. Um, so, um, and I thought this was a particularly appropriate uh, quote uh, and a set of words for, um, you know, the, um, what we are all thinking about today, you know, and so, um, so I wanted to start with that. The next two slides are kind of more um, overviews about environmental justice, what it is, what the definitions are, so on and so forth, uh, just to ground us. And so, you know, on the left uh, hand side of the, of the sl of this slide is US EPA. Um, uh, definition about fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people. But, you know, I never really uh, liked EPA's definition. Um, I thought it was, you know, kind of, and I can go into that uh, at some point. Um, you know, it has its own historical context. Uh, but, um, so there are a lot of other ways of looking at environmental justice. And I thought uh, Professor Bunyan Bryant, who is the first African American uh, professor in the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources uh, definition, which talks about cultural norms and values, um, you know, is, uh, you know um, and sustainability is, you know, maybe a little bit more fuller, you know, definition. But um, you know, maybe for you, and I kind of put this slide together, uh, and maybe this is particularly appropriate for law students is that this is informed by a lot of theories of justice, you know, like procedural justice, you know, uh, uh, procedural justice being, um, you know, making sure that all people, uh, particularly those that are underrepresented, are uh, part of the uh, decision-making process. Uh, distributed justice, meaning which, what kind of populations are more impacted or disproportionately impacted um, negatively. Uh, but also whether or not, you know, the, the, the positive uh, things that are being done um, are, are, are also distributed, uh, you know, equitably. Um, uh, uh, compensatory ju uh, justice, uh, everyone here knows about torts, you know, uh, supplemental environmental uh, projects, which is a way of making sure that penalties, um, you know, are given back to the communities um, in uh, uh, where, um, you know, the violations took place. Uh, social justice, I think Bunyan's definition, you know, kind of begins to speak to that in terms of broader issues like uh, cultural norms and values and sustainability. And then restorative justice, which um, is an interesting one. I kind of added this to what most people start with because you know, um, uh, Terry Williams, who is the uh, environmental manager for the Tulalip tribe in Oregon, talks about um, restorative justice in a Native American context as far as um, um, habitat restoration. And of course, you know, I know there's another way that is being used here, uh, the words are being used here, but you know, um, but this is where this view comes from. But I think uh, all that is to say that, you know, this is a pretty dynamic area, and it's an area that is being shaped. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, one thing that you should take from this is that it is not 
us up here who are shaping it, who are going to be shaping it, it is you down there who are going to be shaping it. So um, the next slide uh, is a slide that says, that looks at, so, you know, when you have all these definitions, what does it actually look like in practice? And so, you know, how do all these things come together? And this slide is something I put together after, to look at like 20 years of practice about, so what is it that we're actually doing when we're talking about fair treatment and meaningful involvement or environmental justice? And so, um, you know, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but you know that, you know, these are issues that involve the built natural and social environments and you know, they lead to impacts of all different kinds, including, like Dean Mahali said, climate um, um, changes. And then there's a set of responses that have evolved uh, in terms of community involvement, of regulatory approaches, collaborative approaches, and then the kind of tools and measures of success or measures um, uh, that, that accompany that. Uh, that is probably a lecture in and of itself. So, you know, this is just to put out there for you so that it grounds you, uh, grounds the conversation. So going now, so with, with those two slides, I thought it would be a good way to start, but the heart of this talk is, you know, from my own personal perspective, over I guess now 35 years of uh, work around environmental justice going back to the 1970s, um, and, um, and so, um, and these focus around, like I said, some of the iconic events, uh, not all, some of the iconic events that, uh, uh, that uh, relate to um, the, uh, the development or the history of environmental justice. And so the first one, uh, as you probably all know about, is Warren County, uh, uh, North Carolina, where um, you know, a poor African uh, American county was cited for a PCB uh, uh, hazardous waste landfill uh, in 1982, and the community there um, took it upon itself to protest. Uh, over 500 arrests were made, uh, and you see a picture of that of people laying in front of the uh, of the trucks. Now, you know, um, of course, you know the the, the protest did not uh, uh, prevent the siting of that landfill, but it led to a lot of things. And you know, on one level, it led to um, North Carolina passing a moratorium on future landfills, um, uh, and that has a lot. There's a long history to that, not the least of which is the fact that the water table in North Carolina is particularly shallow. Um, but the other um, is the fact that um, it led to uh, the um, community, the people in North Car uh, in Warren County. Uh, like Dolly Burwell, who herself was, was arrested five times to say that African Americans in Warren County, North Carolina, decided uh, that um, henceforth and forevermore that they would be um, uh, in control of their own destiny. And so before this um, protest, they had, um, uh, there were no African Americans on the, um, on the county commission, and shortly thereafter, the next election, three out of five. Um, and uh, 12 years later, uh, as we all knew, the landfill leached. And so, um, um, and so uh, there was a whole process uh, to figure out what to do with it, and the, um, and, uh, and the, um, the, the state um, asked um, you know, the, 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 the citizens of North Carolina, and what they said was that, um, uh, uh, so, you know, what to do with it in terms of different remedies, uh, the cheapest one of which was actually to move it to some other site. And they said, uh, the uh, citizens said that no, they wanted to detoxify on site because they said that they didn't, they knew uh, that, that, that if they were to move it, it would go to another community like theirs. And so, um, and so that's the, uh, and so, you know, that's the, what you see there is the order uh, in that arc that I uh, created, the, um, the announcement by North Carolina around, around that decision uh, 12 years later, but 30 years later, there was a celebration of, um, uh, in Coley Spring Baptist Church uh, around the, uh, uh, the uh, Warren County protests. 
And, um, you know, I was fortunate, I was uh, honored to uh, be able to speak there. Uh, and a lot of the other people, including um, in that next picture up there, um, um, uh, uh, Eva Clayton, Congresswoman Eva Clayton, uh, 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 Congressman Fox Butterfield, uh, and, um, and uh, Frank Ballins, a state senator. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Dolly has shown, uh, has, uh, some, of the, some of this represents the state of the, um, of the, um, the, the political empowerment that, went, that has taken place since then. You know, in terms of all the, uh, all the uh, actors uh, from 1982. Um, and, um, and there was one thing, but it doesn't also, but you can't see the depths of this um, as reflected by when uh, Dolly has shown me once a, um, a fax. Um, of, uh, it was a list of all the people that were going to get arrested, that committed to get arrested in Warren County. And then it showed the person who was going to vouch for their bail. Um, and Eva's name was there, right next to each one of them. And so that kind of commitment is the kind of commitment that became uh, part of that political empowerment. And uh, lo and behold, uh, in North Carolina, you know, you know um, um, issued a historical marker. So there's a historical marker on the highway next to the Warren County landfill um, in, in, in that uh, 30 years later. And it kind of uh, commemorated the uh, historic uh, protests in Warren County. And so, you know, this is indeed, you know, a set of history that, um, you know, that we're seeing in terms of environmental justice. So that's the first one. The second one is, um, you know, toxic waste and race. And Quentin gave you a little bit of history uh, to that. Um, it was the first national study on the demographics related <coughs> to the, um, uh, the location of hazardous waste sites. And as you could see, I had all black hair at that point. <laughs> And, um, and, um, but, um, uh, and I don't need to go into the specifics of the, of the study uh, or the things like that, and I'll be glad to talk about it. Uh, but, you know, what that had led to were some pretty um, remarkable things. Um, the first of which um, is, um, you know, the, uh, the first national conference, uh, academic conference, on the uh, race and, and uh, uh, incidents of environmental hazards, um, organized by uh, professors uh, Bunyan Brown and Paul Mohai at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources. Um, you know, when I was figuring, trying to do this uh, talk, I was thinking about, well, okay, so the next slide should be a whole, um, you know, a, a, t a, a discussion of all the kinds of research in all different areas that have. Um, uh, taking place since then, uh, it is. There's no time for that, but that is, in fact, you know, something that is really, truly ro robust and remarkable. Um, and secondly, um, is uh, you know, led to um, it helped lead to the um, or it sparked the uh, a lot of grassroots um, uh, activism. Um, you know, I had people call me up um, after toxic waste and race and said, you know, now we have something that uh, really uh, kind of uh, uh, says, says something that we um, have known all the time, you know, um, uh, because, uh, you know, at that point in the 1980s, people did not make a connection between civil rights and uh, environmentalism. In fact, I used to tell my board that, um, uh, I used to tell, tell my board that, you know, you hire me to work, um, on an issue that did not have a name, and it did not have a name, you know. Um, and so, you know, first people of color environmental leadership summit. Uh, Richard was part of uh, helping to, um, you know, organize and lead that. Um, you know, brought together um, you know, uh, 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 community grassroots uh, activists from uh, people of color communities across the country. Uh, we had expected that uh, success. I had expected success to be about 300 people, over 1,000 people showed up in Washington, D.C., you know, and uh, that was the principles of environmental justice were codified, um, and of course, um, you know, there's a lot of history that goes on uh, beyond that. Um, the, um, the next one um, I thought was an interesting piece to this. Um, 
So this is a picture of uh, Lou Cole, and uh, for those of you who are, um, uh, you know, studying law, uh, Lou Cole is um, um, a attorney of uh, grassroots um, uh, environmental justice attorney, of uh, a, a, a remarkable um, attorney, and um, uh, this really um, uh, incredible work. Um, uh, and you know, he, um, uh, you know advance all kinds of new legal theories, uh, not the least of which was the idea that one should actually, um, you know, target the producers of, um, you know, products that lead to climate change. Um, and um, I only got five more minutes for you. <laughs> okay, so I, but um, Luke, um, you know, Luke told, sent me his article uh, from the, um, um, his first law review article, and he wrote in there, you know, it was because of toxic waste and race that he decided to pursue this area of law. And then the last person here is Aaron Myers. Aaron was fighting a um, toxic waste um, landfill, um, uh, an incinerator in the Arbor, Man Arbor Hill uh, community of Albany, New York. And, um, you know, he f has always told me that, you know, that report had helped him, like, to articulate the issue as they saw it uh, so much more uh, profoundly. And now Aaron, um, lo and behold, is the president of the National Sierra Club. And so this is, tells you the reflect of the kind of changes that are taking place. So I'm gonna go through the next two pretty quickly, the executive order. Um, there's a whole set, uh, because of what's happened in, in the last eight years, there's now a body of work uh, including um, uh, rulemaking guidance, including enforcement guidance, including a nationally consistent EJ screening tool, EJ screen, um, uh, um, uh, me analytic methodologies for incorporating the NEPA in the uh, EJ and the NEPA process, and so on and so forth, that has uh, taken place. And um, that, again, is a, is a, is a huge, um, um, I think a, a advance, and I am really pleased that something like that now exists um, so that there's a coherent set of approaches towards how you integrate environmental justice into the regulatory process. And then the last one, uh, I think that is the, um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the view from Harold Mitchell's house in, um, in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and you're gonna hear from Harold later, so I'm not gonna go into this a lot, but um, uh, this focuses on um, you know brownfields and community revitalization and the con and the conversation that we were able to engender from that. Um, um, the um, you know um, that view is uh, there's a uh, four four hundred and fifty thousand brownfields across the country, um, and um, you know um, I thought it was important at that point to not just talk about. Um, you know, the, the ways, the approaches in terms of uh, regulatory approaches or ways to, to uh, uh, mitigate, uh, um, you know, impacts, but also to put the community on a positive path uh, in terms of revitalization. Uh, and, and, um, and so you're going to hear a wonderful story around that um, from Harold, um, and it is the, um, the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, inspiration or one of the inspirations for EPA's um, environmental justice collaborative problem solving model. So um, I wanted to kind of conclude by talking about, so what does this all mean for you? Uh, and I know that um, U.S. students here um, are here because you want to really make a difference. And I kind of get that sense from all of you when I talk with you. Uh, but this is a very uncertain time. And we should all know. We all know that is an uh, uncertain time. Uh, so, what does this, you know, actually, um, you know, mean? And um, and so, I thought it'd be important to step back a little bit. And um, I I want to kind of uh, kind of go through this in a way that uh, makes sense to me because, you know, t about 20 years ago in 1990, about 15 years ago in 1999. Um, when I, uh, right before I went to work for uh, US EPA, I kind of wrote an article. Um, and, um, and I said at that point, you know, after working on environmental justice, uh, uh, an issue without a name for two decades, um, I uh, had come to one conclusion back in 1999, was that environmental justice was here to stay. 
and, uh, and, uh, and there was a number of reasons I go through. Uh, and as I go through this from a perspective maybe uh, a decade and a half later, um, I think you would say that I could say that environmental justice is not only here to stay, but it is, has thrived. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, we know that there's been uh, in just an incredible uh, breadth of um, and sophistication in community uh, initiatives, uh, including those that uh, focus on climate. You're going to hear about those, uh, but we know that that is happening and it, it's just abounding across the country. Um, secondly, uh, there's a robust academic efforts, uh, this being only one of them. I think there are um, hun um, maybe thousand uh, or more um, peer review articles, journal articles on environmental justice now. Um, um, there are hundreds of courses on environmental justice. There's even a PhD program at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources on, 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 on environmental justice. And I was just in Portland last week where a high school leader said she took an environmental justice class in her high school class, in her high, you know, in her high school. So, so that's uh, one, you know, I think this is not going away, you know. Um, Secondly, I think there's importance, um, as we all think about the future, uh, to look at states. Because a lot of energy, uh, both on the community activist side and on, the, um, you know, on those of, of you that look at uh, public policy, always focus on the federal government. And there are reasons maybe for that. Um, but I think that uh, we really need to look at states. Uh, as, um, so there's a, uh, there's a survey, a uh, 50 state survey on, on, on state efforts around environmental justice. The last issue, last issue was in 2010, uh, and the tagline for that was 50 Laboratories of Democracy. And I thought that's a really kind of appropriate, um, you know, v image for you. Uh, and there are ha what's happening at states are things like in California, uh, Senate Bill 535 took 25% of the um, uh, greenhouse gas reduction funds uh, and uh, for uh, designated for use in um, disadvantaged communities. The first year of operation of that fund, that was $272 million. Um, the um, New York State has a Brownfield Ar uh, Opportunity Areas Program, uh, which is area-wide planning, and we could talk about the significance of that. I was in Oregon last week for an air toxics and environmental justice workshop. Uh, the state of Oregon is committed now to developing health-based standards for air toxics, including uh, the addressing uh, of uh, cumulative risk assessment. So there are things happening there that are, could be really groundbreaking, and so I would urge that you just also look there in terms of places where um, you know uh, you should be thinking about your work, and we haven't even gotten to local government yet, you know, or tribes. Um, so, and then lastly, um, you know, I think uh, I mean I've sensed it. I think you've sensed it. Um, you know, um, there's a new sense of um, civil society and collective leadership. New and renewed relationships, you know, are sprouting and deepening. Um, and, uh, you know, and, um, and I think um, this is going to be really important because that is really uh, more than anything, all of us as individuals uh, are going to be, you know, operating within. And so, um, and I see that, I think that this is something that we should all take note of and think about how to build on that. And I just wanted to um, kind of conclude uh, by, um, you know, I said in 19, 99 that you know one of the reasons I thought environmental justice was here to stay was because um, of fair-minded and far-sighted leaders at all levels you know and um, and actually um, one of them um, you know I spoke in Minnesota uh, in December right after the elections and you know I had taught they wanted me to speak to the Minnesota Environmental Forum, and I told them I didn't really want to. I don't know what I'm supposed to say, you know. Um, and I had this inspiration, you know, and it's, you know, it was around that. And so it was Paul Wellstone. And Paul Wellstone, um, if you look at the um, picture of the uh, signing of the executive order uh, in the Oval Office, uh, Senator Wellstone was there. 
But what most of you don't know is that when we were coming to Washington, D.C., when Richard and I and others were coming to Washington, D.C. in the 80s, um, Paul would always meet with us. Now, for a U.S. senator to do, to do that, that's pretty remarkable, you know. And um, I did not, um, I, I, I wanted to tell the story that Jose Bravo, who's a pretty um, well-known um, EJ activist from California, um, you know, uh, told me, and uh, so I didn't say it, right, uh, because I didn't want to get it messed up. Um, and, um, but what happened was, um, and I think this speaks to what, it, there's a yearning of people to do this. Um, what happened, so this is a forum that had the Michi Minnesota Environmental Commissioner, the Minnesota Health Commissioner, the Minneapolis Health Commissioner. It had the uh, whole bunch of other people, including uh, community leaders. So what happened was everybody started telling their own Paul Wellstone stories, you know? And, you know, it was like this thing that in, in terms of, and, and then finally, Shalini Gupta from, um, you know, came up and she said, well, this is a story uh, that Jose Bravo would tell you. And that has to do with uh, when um, uh, Paul and a number of other congressional uh, representatives went to um, uh, visit uh, facilities on the U.S.-Mexico border and the facility owner said that, um, that um, 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 you know, members of Congress, you can come in but community members, you cannot. And Paul said, no, uh, um, you know, they don't come, we don't go. And I think, uh, and I wanna end with that because, you know, we all have to take a stand. I mean, that's the kind of stand that we have to take. Uh, and in order to d carry out what President Obama kind of urged us to do, which is to understand how we can make a difference, and you can do that in whatever way, shape, or form that you're going to, uh, in pursuing your, you know, uh, professional careers, that we all have a role in making a difference. So I want to stop with that and thank you very much. I'd like to point out that just about any thing you need to know about environmental justice, you can find on Google. Okay, but you cannot understand it unless you meet and talk with people like Charles. Um, there's a lot of opinions out there, but I mean, everything is out there free. But please take advantage of having him here today. Just roll up on him, pull out your little cards, because I know all your students have your own little cards now, um, and make contact. One of the reasons we're here is we, we're looking for you. Talk about all that white hair he's got on his head. Um, where is the next wave? Where's the next leadership coming from? Okay, there are plenty of stories who students have come up and say, well, Professor Perra, I don't know how to get started in this. I said, You'd be surprised how leadership comes out of the, the young students like yourselves. And the way you get started is talk to the old students like ourselves about how to do it and what's important to us and take whatever knowledge we can give you and use that. So, uh, finally, say you need to look up Charles Lee online. I mean, Charles was director of the Office of Environmental Justice at EPA. He is, he's done all kinds of work, which he, he, we can't go in here today, but um, this is truly one of the forces behind the environmental justice movement today and be well advised to do a little extra reading on it. Moving right on to um, Richard, um, also, Sherry has already pulled my coat, and Charles used up the rest of our time, but uh, well worth it. Um, any one of us could just sit up here for an hour and a half and talk, but uh, Richard Moore is someone you need to hear from. So, Richard, if you would, please. Uh, good morning, sisters and brothers. I just gotta wanted do, you to gotta do a little better than that, please. You know, just, 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 we'll make sure you're still awake. I just uh, wanted to take uh, just a, a minute of time uh, to uh, remember um, our elders, those that have passed, um, not only in the environmental and economic justice movement, 
but those uh, that have been present uh, in this institution um, here at Vermont Law School, those that have given up their lives in the civil rights movements and liberation movements and human rights movements, social and economic justice movements uh, that make it possible for us to be uh, in this room today. So I would just ask for just uh, Quentin, if I may, just for a moment of silence uh, to remember our family members and, and, and those other sisters and brothers that make it possible, help it possible for us to be here. Good, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I was remembering, um, you know, as I was coming into Vermont, you know, it, it, it took us a little bit of time to, uh, to get here. Uh, I traveled from Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and uh, it almost reminded me actually of uh, not the first People of Color Summit, um, but a meeting that took place in New Mexico a year before the first People of Color Summit, uh, which was the first convening of people of color and Native Indigenous peoples in the southwestern part of the United States that took place in 1990, and a, and a reporter um, had come to us um, and, uh, and, 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 and had said that, um, where did, how did people get uh, in this room today? Uh, the hundreds of people that were represented uh, there in this convening in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and I said they came many, many different ways. Uh, some came by horseback, uh, some hitchhiked. Um, some of us came on airplanes, some came in automobiles, um, and so on. And almost, that almost happened to me yesterday, trying to get to Vermont. <laughs> you, know, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I needed to be at the airport, you know, close to 3 o'clock in the morning. My plane was leaving at 5 in the morning. Um, the sister that was bringing me or taking me to the airport was running a little bit behind schedule. So I said, hey, if, uh, if she don't show up pretty soon, I'm going to have to take the horse to the airport. <laughs> Um, and then uh, we flew into from Albuquerque to Dallas, Texas, uh, and then from Dallas uh, to Boston, um, and then two sisters uh, pick, picked us up. Uh, well, we went to the EPA office, um, and, uh, and then we drove, and we drove to another small city. I think I was in another small city, and then we did a, a drive-by, and then one of the students uh, picked us up there. We, we put our bags into the other vehicle, um, and then we drove here. Uh, so, uh, so it's an honor to be in your presence. Uh, I do have to, one, uh, mention several things before I make these brief comments. Uh, one is a, a, a disclaimer, um, as Charles has did. I am the national uh, chair of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under President Clinton's executive order. Um, and uh, that's very, very important. I'll touch on that uh, in a minute. But the disclaimer is, is that, uh, for those of you that are knowledgeable, it is a stakeholder group. It's a federal advisory committee that's made up of academics. It's made up of grassroots leaders. It's made up of non-governmental organizations, environmental organizations. Um, it's made up of tribal representatives. Uh, it's made up of other native indigenous peoples. Um, and, uh, and so I'm officially not, my, my words today are, are not uh, officially spoken in behalf of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. I am here today um, as the uh, co-coordinator of Los Jardines Institutes, the Gardens Institute in English, um, and we run uh, an organic uh, farm uh, in Albuquerque uh, and another one in uh, the northern part of New Mexico. Uh, we work on literacy and environmental and, econ environmental and economic justice issues, um, and that's in my capacity uh, one of my capacities of being present uh, here with you all today. I'm also uh, one of the national co-coordinators of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, which is a coalition and alliance of grassroots, African American, Latino, Native American, and Asian Pacific Islanders, and others, grassroots groups that are working throughout this country um, on environmental and economic justice issues. And I happen to be um, one of the board members of the Just Transition Alliance, which brings together uh, both labor uh, and, and, and grassroots. Uh, so, because every attempt many, many years ago was to attempt to try to separate workers from community and from community from workers. And many years back, we formed an alliance of workers and grassroots community members 
uh, to forge and continue to build on the environmental and economic justice movement as we move forward. So that's who I'm, that's who, uh, I'm, I'm representing today. Um, so I just want to touch, if I can, just on some, some, some history for, for a moment. Uh, one I remember in, 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 19, in the 1960s, uh, for many of you that, that, that don't know, um, also our organization was the author of a publication called How Not to Be Ripped Off by Lawyers. And so I wanted, to, I wanted to share that with you because I didn't want you to find out after I left and went back to New Mexico um, that these were the folk that wrote that document, how not to be ripped off by attorneys, how not to be ripped off by lawyers. And, uh, and some of our sisters and brothers, some of our friends, Luke Cole and Dion Ferris and some of our other sisters and brothers, some of the best uh, legal, uh, legal advisors, legal technicians in the country uh, said, well, you may not want to call it that. Why don't you just maybe, you really do kind of want to call it that, but why don't you just reword it and, 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 and name it working with lawyers? <laughs> and so uh, I would highly encourage uh, you all uh, that have not seen that publication. Um, it was co-produced uh, with the Environmental Law Institute out of Washington, D.C., uh, who which uh, many of us have had the honor to work with uh, throughout the years and the document uh, under the new name is working with lawyers. Uh, so I would encourage you uh, to take a look at that. You know, in, 19, in the 1960s, uh, for many of us, uh, you know, that, that have been working on, uh, on social justice and racial justice, civil rights and civil rights issues uh, for, all, for all these years, um, whether it was immigration and, you know, one of the things that always kind of amazed us uh, was that, uh, we always are talking about at the end of the day uh, about these lazy Mexicans or, or whatever, uh, all, this, all this language that's, that's just being tossed, ignorance and arrogance and racism and homophobia and sexism and everything. And then, you know, it was a very interesting thing for many of us that come from Latino families and from Latino communities throughout this country and beyond. Um, I just will remind you all, you all, as reminded county governments and city governments, state governments and federal governments and others, that when Katrina came down in New Orleans, who were those folk that were in and living in and staying in those homes um, with disease in the houses and so on after Katrina came down? But we seemed to be all right if we were just cleaning up things for other people, no? Um, what about our sisters and brothers? And we'll hear uh, uh, from our sisters from Puerto Rico and whatever. What about the pharmaceutical companies that have been responsible for the poisoning, the contamination, and the killing of many of our people for many, many years, for many of us that have lived outside the fences of many of those pharmaceutical companies? And our children were being born without brains, being born with various kinds of diseases, and so on. Oh, we just seem to be all right if we were just those quiet people that just stay on the other side of the fence and just do and continue to do what we're told to do. What about our sisters and brothers in Texarkana, Texas, an African-American community that was built on top of a creosote facility and the developers of that particular the housing division that took place in Texarkana, Texas, was extremely aware that there was a creosote facility that was there before that community and those homes were built. What about our sisters and brothers in Native American communities throughout this country on the rim of the Grand Canyon? Last week we just had a meeting in Albuquerque, New Mexico with leadership of the Habasupai tribe, the brothers and sisters that have lived for hundreds of years at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. What about, what about the uranium mining that's taking place on the rim of the Grand Canyon? And because of much of that uranium mining, that the water is being contaminated, and our sisters and brothers at the end of the day have been drinking contaminated water. What about my community in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where a child was born six months, six months took a bottle of water from the formula as the mother warmed up the bottle for that child and then, the, and then gave the child the bottle and turned away for a minute and then turned back and that child was turning bright blue because the oxygen was being sucked out of the body of that young, young child at that moment. And then we come to find out 
for 25 years, county government, city government, state government, and federal government was aware that our community had been drinking and bathing in contaminated water for over 25 years. Who was the responsible party for that water contamination issue when in fact we were being told that it was our responsibility? Because you know, you know you've, heard this, you've heard this story over and over again. If we wouldn't be doing what we were doing, then in many cases, what's been happening to many of us would not be happening. That was an Air Force base that was responsible because we were downhill from Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and our water was poisoned, and we were drinking and bathing in contaminated water for 25 years. Sisters and brothers, at the end of the day, what about our farm workers, sisters and brothers, that make it possible to be eating the produce that not only being served in this school or whatever, but in restaurants, in homes, and whatever throughout this country? What about those workers that were totally, totally, totally pesticide planes flying over fields and dropping pesticides, DDT and other kind of chemicals on those workers with no notice. What about those young sisters and brothers? What about those mothers that had their children in those fields because there was no place or no place for our people to go to child care centers or do whatever. And so many of our people have had to take our young children into the fields and lay the children while the women and the men were working in the fields and at the same time take care of, take over, take care of those children. What about our sisters and brothers in Appalachia? What about those throughout this country and throughout this world? And at the first People of Color Summit, we said it will never be ashamed again that we will not allow city governments, county governments, state governments, or federal governments to continue to do and to impose on us, our communities, as workers, as people of color, as native indigenous people, as poor white working class communities throughout, the, that it will never be the same. And I come from you today, as Charles stated, to say that it will never be the same. It will never continue to be the same. So it only takes me a minute to get upset because, you know, for many of us, you know, we've lost a lot of sisters and brothers in this struggle throughout these years. And, and 51 years ago, when, when elders called myself and some other young women and some young men to a village in northern New Mexico and said, do you realize the responsibility? Do you realize as you're organizing and you're mobilizing your communities and so on, the responsibility that, that you're, you're taking on at this moment? And I say to you what they said to us 51 years ago in that small rural village community, small rural village in northern New Mexico. They say, young sisters and brothers, we asked you never to forget three things. One, always remember where you came from. Two, always remember who makes it possible for you to be here. That can be your grandparents, your mother and father, your next door neighbors, civil rights leaders, liberation leaders. It could be human rights leaders. It could be. And thirdly, they said, always give back to others what's been given to you. Always remember where you came from. Never forget those that make it possible for us to be here. And number three, always give back to others what's been given to you. And that's what I think about a piece about what we're doing here today. So we could go through 500 years of oppression. We could talk about the thievery of the land and the resources and, and our water in the southwestern part of the United States. We could go on and we could be reminded what our elders told us in that meeting also, that there was strong relations between the southeastern part of the United States and the southwestern part of the United States because of the questions of land and water in African American communities and in Chicano, Mexicano. Latino communities. So as we do that, and as we continue in this discussion, in this dialogue, I will leave you with just several things. One, there would be not, no discussion of environmental justice if there wasn't environmental injustice. Number two, when we redefined at the First People of Color Summit environmental and conservationism as where we work, where we live, where we play, where we pray and where we go to school or where we learn. And when environmental and conservationists said to us, you opened up the box too big. And then we added what was called environmental racism to the picture. No? And then if it wasn't made clear enough, we had the nerve 
to call it environmental genocide. Because what I say to you is that many of what's been, many of the issues that we've been working on are not unintentional, they're extremely intentional. There was a report that was put out that talked about, that we got our hands on. And that report said, where do we site these facilities? And you know, very interestingly, it was from a Southwestern perspective that the report, report was, the report was asked to be put together uh, by a group of industry representatives to talk about where, the, where facilities should be sited. And very interesting, one of the things that they said was, sited in Catholic communities. Nah. We look at the Southwest, we look at Chicano, we look at Mexicano, we look at Latino communities, um, and who primarily lives? In Catholic communities. I don't know, we're not imagining things, we're not making things up or anything. It said, cite the facilities where communities are supposedly less educated. I don't know. You know? It said, cite the facilities where the communities don't have no political clout. I don't know. We always thought we did have political clout, but that's all right. If we ain't had none then, we go send us a hell of a political clout before this is all over. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> so what I'm saying here is that it wasn't unintentional where many of these facilities were located. And we understand permitting, and we understand zoning, and we understand all of these things. But it's the intentional targeting of low-income, working-class communities of color and Native indigenous communities that many of these facilities are being located in. So I say to you then, if that's our reality, is it about where do we go from here? You know, we've had incredible successes, no? One was the presidential executive order. It didn't happen out of the kindness of anybody's heart, I can guarantee you. It took movement to move the signing of the presidential executive order. Just like in New Mexico, we've got the, the governor's executive order on environmental justice. Nothing at the end of the day was done by one individual, by two individuals. It was done by people like yourselves, students, community, elders, seniors, children coming together to build the kind of momentum that's necessary to come to the solutions that many of us to come to. So I, I just want to close there because I know it's the beginning of a long couple of days. But we could go on and on with successes. We were the first organization, grassroots organization in the country to sign a military contract because of the poisoning of our community. And so we signed that contract with that military. And I remember not to go into this story when one of the generals or one of the colonels said, I will never sit with you at the same table ever. And I told him was, I don't know, as my mama told me, never say never. <laughs> I don't know. But all I know, it's a year later, and we're not sitting at a square table, we're sitting at a round table, because there is no head of this table, because we're all at this table equally. And you're signing a document that you said never, never. We have incredible successes, incredible successes on and on. We build some of the strongest relations. You know, I'm giving a short version of a long story the letters to what was called the Group of Ten, the letters, in fact, that, that were sent by grassroots groups charging the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency with environmental racism. I mean, we could go on and on and on. It's not just a, it's not just a thing, no? Um, the document, the co-optation document, you have to take a look at our, at our history and, and our historical documents. What's called the co-optation document. That was a letter that was distributed internal to the US EPA in those time periods that said that we need to put an end to this movement and we need to put it now. Because if the emergence of civil rights and environmental justice comes together, we've got one of the most dangerous, dangerous movements in the history of this country. All right. Mm -hmm. And so. Sisters and brothers, I, I, I just will say this to you in closing. There was a misunderstanding because environmental justice has always been about civil rights. And civil rights has always been about environmental justice, environmental racism, and whatever. So I, I just wanted to thank you all on behalf of our, our, our children, uh, in behalf of, of our youth, in behalf of our adults, in behalf of our elders. Uh, I sincerely want to thank you, uh, and, and they've asked me to bring 
uh, greetings uh, from, our, from, our, from, our, from our organizations and from our leadership and so on. We are truly building an intergenerational movement. We are not standing in front of nobody or behind anybody because at the end of the day, our history and culture says that we need to be standing side by side with each other. So thank you very much. It's not, it's not, just, it's not just our first time here, but I just wanted to thank you all. And if you noticed, I had all these notes that they sent with me and everything else, and I didn't deal with them. But, uh, <laughs> but that's all right. I, I only wish that uh, you all had an opportunity to hear uh, uh, Richard when he was really passionate about something. <laughs> <laughs> Not as laid back and cool today. Um, I wanted to take note, he was talking about the lawyers being ripped off. We'll talk about that off stage. Uh, but about how changing a name. And he spoke of environmental racism, which was the term that came out of Charles's report, Toxic Waste and Race in America. And when the, the, his, the director of, 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 the, uh, of the commission that uh, assigned the work to Charles said, called it for what it was, environmental racism. Everyone went, oh, no, this is terrible. You don't know. And the name morphed into environmental justice. And it became more palatable for discussion. And then particularly when it was pointed out, you know, this is not a black thing. This is not about colored people. There are more poor white people in this country than there are people of color. And they suffer the same as these communities of color. And it created the possibility to have, to enlarge the conversation when you realize we are all in this boat together. There's no privileged group except, well, the one percenters and the two percenters. And, but that's a, a whole different thing about class. And what I wanted to point out here is in, in this context, it, and you probably didn't take note, and I don't know why I did, but Richard was sitting right next to Randy. Randy is representing the interest of business at this conference in environmental justice. And Richard in particular, and people like Randy and, and Randy's partner, Ben Wilson, have earned respect for working together with one another on the problems of environmental justice. Um, ben Wilson, his partner, and myself, and Nicholas Targ, when we were co-chairs of the American Bar Association, had this uh, survey, the 50-state survey that Charles re re uh, spoke on, um, which shows the action on environmental justice is in the states. That's where it is now. Uh, and also that you cannot do this from one perspective. That's why the, the f people worry about oh, environmental justice, the federal government. I don't worry about that. Environmental justice, as Charles has said, is here to stay, and it all depends on what you want to do with it. We need more people like you to follow in Randy's footsteps, to be in business, and use environmental justice to bring the people in business together with grassroots communities. Because this is not, like I said, a racial problem. This is an American problem. And it is your problem, because we're all about ready to exit, well, some of us. <laughs> but seriously, that's why the people, but, um, but the fact that Randy is, far, is our closing man, it shows the importance, I think, of business, um, to this conversation. So Randy, if you would, please. Yes, thank you very much. And as he mentioned, Ben Wilson is the chairman of Beverage and Diamond and really wanted to be here. He's sorry that he couldn't, uh, but he's a leader in environmental justice and is a believer in environmental justice. And him, along with Professor Perry, have made me a believer in its importance. He, he mentioned how we're all in the same boat. Now, you might think the corporate attorney is outside of the boat. But we're really, it is true, we're really all inside the same boat. Last night when I was thinking about coming here, I jokingly thought, well, a lot of people probably think my best movie or my favorite movie is Wall Street. <laughs> and Gordon Gecko saying, greed is good. Greed is not good. Greed was never good. Greed is selfish, it is self-destructive, and it's costly for business. 
And so the, it is not unnatural for the corporate side to understand the importance of environmental justice. Our world is changing. And really what comes to mind is a saying I used to hear, I'm from St. Louis, and there's a saying for a, a muffler, Midas muffler shop, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And so if I had to think of a movie and a title, I would think more of Spike Lee, do the right thing. Because at the end of the day, a company should, within the, its fabric, learn that it should engage and include the public. It should be transparent. And it needs to understand very clearly, unequivocally, that now in 2017, we live in a green world. It matters. I used to be a general counsel for two major water utilities, Metropolitan St. Louis Sewer District, where we brought in green initiatives. And then I moved to DC Water, where they looked up and their consent degree did not have the green initiatives. And they decided, wait a minute, we want that benefit. So we opened up that consent decree and modified it. So both of them brought in the green initiatives. It's a reality. DC Water recently had a green bond, the first ever green bond. It's a reality that if you're a business and you're going to be a player, people are watching you. And they're looking to see how are you, where do you rank on the measure of your green positive actions. Now, let me tell you a little bit briefly of, of recent developments in EJ. 16 federal agencies signed the Memorandum of Understanding on Environmental Justice and Executive Order 12898, recommending to, and this all happened in 2011, recommending to addressing environmental justice through more collaborative, comprehensive, and efficient programs. One month later, the following the MOU, EPA issued Plan EJ 2014, the agency's strategic plan for integrating environmental justice into all agency programs, policies, and activities, trying to make it part of its fabric. Now in 2016, the U.S. Commission for Civil Rights published the report analyzing EPA's compliance with Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, an, exec an executive order 12898. The report concluded it found that EPA was largely, has largely failed in providing relief in communities of color impacted by pollution and that the agency does not take action when facing environmental justice concerns until forced to act. Specifically, the commission indicated that EPAs of civil rights, um, indicated CPAs of civil rights has never made a formal finding of discrimination required under Title VI and that EPA's final coal ash rule negatively impacts two impacts low income and communities of color disproportionately. As a result, two months after the release of the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights Report, EPA released EJ 2020 Action Agenda, the agency's strategic plan for ensuring that minority, low income, and indigenous communities are not suffering dis disparate, disparate environmental and public health impacts. EJ 2020 describes EPA's intent to integrate EJ into all agencies' actions. Now one thing that's interesting, and Professor Richard Lazarus noted it, environmental justice does not find much formal expression in environmental law. There are no specific federal statu statutes or regulations dedicated to addressing environmental justice issues, including the distribution of environmental risk or, or benefits. Executive order 12898 creates no right to judicial review for alleged noncompliance. But the existing environmental statutes and the Civil Rights Act, however, can and are being used to further environmental justice. What it demands is that you as lawyers be creative in addressing the issue, an issue that has been there. Environmental justice and the need for it is not new, but you have to take your tool set that you have, be it the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and down the list, and use those as like a surgeon to address environmental justice. Now, corporate America has been slow to engage the community, and let's face it, and I think in some ways new technology is making it so that they are watched more, that you cannot simply pollute in the river in the Mississippi and just not tell the people that you're not doing it and then it just isn't told or isn't spoken about. 
Now we live in a society where it's in, on YouTube. It's going to be on the internet. And so it's watched and it's known. And so what these corporations have to do is become more sophisticated. Employing EJ is the best interest of the company because it gives them a pretext to initiate communications and continue to engage the company and allows them to come up with common sense solutions. Obfuscation and subterfuge don't work. It's a lot like when I was a kid, I used to have in the backyard a little, I say carousel, where your kids could pull and you'd go around in circles. As long as we're on it, we could sit and talk and we're, we're having fun. But once it stops and you get off, you're wobbling. You're unsure, you're unstable. If you're like me, you fell down. And other people see that. <coughs> And see, these corporations now live in a world where they're going to be seen. And as their attorney, it's better for me to instruct them on how to do it right at the beginning, make it part of their fabric, versus to turn around at the end and have to clean it up. Because to clean it up is costly with the fines and all that will come with it. Now, let's look at some corporations. Valerio is an international manufacturer of, trans of uh, transportation fuels. And they among, were among the first energy companies to adapt or adopt a formal environmental justice policy and initiative outreach to fence line communities. Now, while they weren't able to come to uh, a, a finalization or, or an agreement on the chemicals, the benzene that was there, they did come to an agreement that there was no adequate access to health care in the community. That's the company in the, in the community came to agreement on that. That the community was a food desert that Valerio needed better quality workers than uh, Port Authority schools were producing. So they diverted, they convinced EPA to divert $1 million from a supplement environmental project, CASEP, from a consent decree under the Clean uh, Air Act finalized in 2011 related to other projects, to another project to build a health clinic in the poorest part of Port Arthur. In addition, De Valerio devoted extra funds and had of Valerio employees provide construction oversight uh, for, of a clinic and stretch the money enough to build a health clinic. And that's one other thing. Also, as you work on cases, you might be involved in consent decree like I was twice. EPA will give you possibly an opportunity to do a SEP. Now, the SEP is not directly facing the problem that your consent de decree focuses on, but it gives you a chance to put money someplace else that you weren't, and do something that you weren't required to do that's a benefit to your community. Well, you need to think when you're in those positions, when you're in those chairs, when you're running that department, okay, I have an opportunity to do a SEP, which is probably going to be a couple of million dollars worth of improvements. How can I do it in a way that benefits environmental justice and promotes environmental justice? Another corporation is the Marathon Oil an independent energy company that has facilities in North America, Europe, and Africa. Now, they operate a one refinery in southwest region of Detroit, the only refinery in the state of Michigan with a majority Latino population. The region is surrounded by heavy industry, including Marathon Petroleum, uh, uh, Sever Steel, uh, Steel, U.S. Steel, and Detroit Wastewater Plant, all within four miles of, of one another in a community about 25,000 people. Their emissions contribute only 2% of the overall emission in the uh, Four Mile area. What happened was the citizens in that community had the courage to stand up and they took their own environmental samples. Now this is truth to power. And that's one thing that you have to embody yourself with as environmental ju justice attorney. That they, the, the citizens took their own, in, their own samples, presented it to the powers that be and then Marathon, looking at the evidence that was presented, decided to do a buyout of the, of the homes that were there. And since that time, Marathon Petroleum has contracted 349 of the 463 properties in the uh, nearby Oakwood Heights. Of the 463 properties, 265 were habitable. 90% of the habitable properties are under contract. So this is an opportunity to really affect people's lives. There's a bad situation there. How can we get people away from that? The buyout is efficient. The buyout is something that they may not have done in years past. 
But now, because of where we are and how strong EJ is in this country, there's an understanding that this may be the right business decision to make. See, once it's the right business decision, and you're in that C-suite, and they're saying this is the right thing to do, it's amazing how quickly things start to happen. And the reasoning for it to happen becomes, more, becomes stronger and more accepted. According to Marathon Petroleum spokesman, the average appraisal for the homes was about $16,000, and the company's average offer for each home was about $65,000. Some residents moved to alternative neighborhoods, others moved out of the city completely, and some stayed. As a result, Marathon's EJ, of Marathon's EJ efforts, potential impact of the new projects were minimized because Marathon went beyond the regulatory minimum. Another company to look at is Pacific Gas and Electric. They have come in and have decided to make, uh, to adopt an environmental justice policy in which the company acknowledges their commitment to work, work diligently to address all environmental issues. And that they establish clear guidelines on how the company can work cooperatively with communities. Additional EJ initiatives were included. Employment of full-time environmental justice program manager. These are some of the things that you can demand when you're at the table. Training and educating employers about environmental justice and companies' policies through multi-year training programs. Managing operations and facilities to minimize impacts on nearby communities. Taking responsibility for impacts related to historic operations. These are all things that you can do to make change. Now this one, since I'm in the water wastewater business, hits close to home. Sewage in the Water Board of New Orleans. Now they entered into a consent decree. There was concern that the, uh, on the ground they had maintained an old sewage collection system that allowed raw human sewage to run, into the, f run in the streets of uh, New, New Orleans when it rained. Now the parties actively negotiated a consent decree which was signed in 1998. And the terms of the agreement, I'll read you just a couple of them. The consent decree required New Orleans to renovate its 50-year-old sewage system uh, in a time frame of 11 years, which is fast in a wet water, wastewater environment. The consent decree also called for the board to restore Lincoln Beach, a historically African-American beach from the days of seg segregation, rather than pay a higher money penalty. Be strategic in what you ask for. Is it truly money that you want, or is it an end result that you want? Present it in a business faction, and the business, again, in the C-suite, they may actually grab on to, what, to your idea, an idea that maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you would not even think of putting on, on the table. The board spent $2 million improving water quality along Lincoln Beach, a park which was created for a purpose of serving African Americans who were barred by law from admission to the then white only beach amusement park. Part of these efforts include restoration of area wetlands through planting of species that would help restore the area to fishable and swimmable conditions. What you have to do is flip the script. Have ongoing meetings and listening sessions. This is what the business has to do. They cannot just be up on the Golden Hill by themselves. They have to be able to come down and listen with the communities and how, what they think the problems are and what they think the solutions are. Because sometimes you don't know when you're far away on the top floor of the office building. Engage businesses, people, I'm sorry, engage businesses so people can prosper. Offer employee training programs, employ a workforce that gives back, become part of the community. And you'll see that more and more when you watch commercials or you read stock returns, you listen to MSNBC. You're seeing more and more businesses are trying to be part of, of the community. The last thing I'll, I'll share with you in, in, in brief is that more and more you're able to become involved. There was an issue that took place actually in uh, Curtis Bay, Baltimore, Curtis Bay uh, near Baltimore, Maryland, where a group called the Free Young Voice went on a campaign of canvassing neighbors, organizing protests, and circulating petitions to stop a trash incinerator. And so they pushed and they pushed, and they had signed an agreement to purchase. They found out the Baltimore City's public schools had signed an agreement to purchase energy from the incinerator. They were successful in not only having the, the school back out of it, 
but all of the other agencies backed out of it. In fact, all 22 customers canceled their contracts, leaving the incinerator with no customers to sell the energy to. Mm -hmm. Now, what could be more dramatic, more powerful, more of a business decision on what should I have done so I didn't end up at that intersection than thinking about these problems before or to counsel your business corporation of these issues before they happen. Ultimately, thanks to the group's efforts, the Maryland Department of Environment found the incinerator permit to be invalid. That is failure for a corporation. Again, you carry a lot of weight as that corporate attorney properly counseling them so this does not happen to them. So the bottom line is to matter is to understand that we are all in that boat. You're not Gordon Gecko simply because you're a corporate attorney. You have something to offer to that, to that conversation that can save money, it can save lives. And it pays for businesses in the very end, like I started off, to do the right thing. Thank you very much. I want to personally thank Randy for stepping in at the last minute uh, for Ben and also for working with me on a number of different projects and um, for it also proving that you can go into business make do, and still do good in terms of these communities. More importantly, that we need business, we need people like Randy in the discussion at the round table as Richard uh, described it in the discussion in solving the solutions to these problems in environmental justice. Um, we're going to open up the floor for some questions. We have a few minutes, I believe. Uh, before that, I just simply want to point out, um, give you a little free advice. Imagine that. <laughs> One want to point out the power that you have as students and for you not to waste it. You can walk up to almost anybody and ask them almost anything you want. Maybe not about you know their love life or something like that, but um, you, particularly you know lawyers, people in business, anybody who <laughs> decides to get up on a stage and lecture. The minute you get your degree, you become the competition. Everybody wants to help a student. I've got students calling up the White House. I didn't tell them to do that, but. Um, uh, working on their papers because as students people do want to help you that's why we're here today because we want you guys to get and we want to attract you because we need your help so I'm going to answer your questions just don't ask me about my love life <laughs> so use that while you're a student but I'm serious the day you get your degree you know and which brings me to the point there are too many lawyers out here there are not enough good lawyers out here. Remember that. Um, you know, uh, Vermont has a very high re reputation. And one reason I know is because I used to re review resumes uh, when I was at the Department of Justice, and uh, Vermont is very highly thought of. But one reason I'm back is because it was convinced that there was a real interest in environmental justice. Y'all need to prove me right. And you need to step up and not be afraid to raise a subject in class with your new bosses at the bar association or wherever. You need to be active. And the future leaders of this movement are sitting right here in this, in this audience. If you can, you know, step up and step out on faith. And don't step up here with a mouthful of gimme and a handful of nothing. You have to have some commitment. Um, so I'll, I think I've wasted enough free advice for the moment. And, and I'm now going to open the floor to, our, to questions for any of our panelists. Yes, sir. Could you just identify yourself, please, when you ask your question? Don't. My name is John Coogan. I'm a resident of South Royalton. Um, I'd like to ask Richard Moore a question. Yeah, you were very passionate. Um, this is my partner. She has a, a sign that she gave to one of her daughters. It says, fishing is not a matter of life and death. It's more serious than that. Um, I like to substitute the word 
politics for fishing, that it's a very serious matter. Um, the so-called president of this country uh, proposed a budget. Um, I would like to ask you, what can you highlight some of the major detrimental impacts uh, his budget would have because his, the EPA is going to take a dr drastic hit? Can you uh, highlight some of the major detrimental impacts the, the proposed budget would have on the EPA? Well, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for that, uh, for that comment and then for, for, for the question, as people are aware um, that the, uh, the budget, I think it was 31 percent um, uh, cut back within the, within the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, one, I think, is, is the work that's been done uh, with the interagency working group. Uh, that's been very, very, very important uh, because the EPA actually under President Clinton's executive order um, was the lead federal agency uh, within the interagency working group on environmental justice. Uh, so what does that mean um, in terms of the cutback, um, the 31 percent uh, cutback? As many people know, um, it's just the, the EPA has been an ally of ours in, 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 in many, many cases. That don't necessarily mean that we agree on everything, uh, but has been, um, has been historically an ally, the deregulation versus regulation. Um, I mean, look at some of the states that we're talking about. We work very, very close with states, and we understand that, county, city, and state, state government. Again, what about some of those cutbacks to the states? Um, and, uh, and I think the Environmental Council of the states, you know, has expressed uh, some of those concerns. I think the other one is, is, is the grant resources uh, for balancing and evening, evening, evening um, out the table. Um, the resources, the EJ small grants, um, and so on, that, uh, that has been recommended not only by the NEJAC Council, but by, recommended by grassroots organizations. Cutbacks in the air program, cutbacks in the pesticide program, uh, cutbacks in the, in, in, in the water programs. Um, so we're seeing if that, if that is a reality. I do have to say some of that has not been played out, uh, but I, I will say, and I think the comment was made earlier, uh, nothing is a surprise because that was always said, uh, that was said pre the election. So it's not really, um, so the cutback is, to me is, that's why I put a disclaimer on who I'm representing, and I'm not representing, I'll repeat it, the National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee uh, to the EPA. We have a meeting coming up in Minneapolis next month uh, where the NEJAC Council will convene. Uh, but again, 31%, um, what's the difference between 31% and 50%? There's not a whole lot of difference. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you get the programs out, take the resources, um, eliminate or cut back on the Office of Civil Rights, the staffing within the Office of Civil Rights with the impacts on Title VI and so on, uh, they're already ongoing. So we're seeing some pretty, some pretty drastic stuff. And my last, uh, my last comment will be, you know, I was, I was looking at this document in reference to your question when I was speaking because this is, a, this is a report that will actually be due that we have to have uh, turned in uh, next week. Um, this, is the, this is the environmental and economic justice strategy uh, because on the interagency side, we've filmed a, a tight working relationship with fish and wildlife through the Department of Interior and so on. Many of us come from rural and urban communities. Um, and so this document uh, is the draft document of what will be given next week to Fish and Wildlife in terms of the, the, the only existing um, urban federal refuge in the United States, whether it's a park or whether it's a refuge. Um, this particular document will be the environmental and economic justice strategy for the Oro Grande refuge in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So again, what about all this work, this years and years of building relations with inter agencies and fish and wildlife and many of these Department of Agriculture for many of us that are farmers and so on. So I mean the cutbacks is what I'm saying is, is drastic. But my, I say my last comment, we've been through this before. I'm sorry, I'm not saying it's the same. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna act like it's the same. The, you gotta compare madness, is it madness 101 or is it, or, or, or what is it? It's not the same, but I do wanna say to you is that for many of us, we've been through the Nixon administration, 
Uh, we've been through a whole series of administrations. We're still here, and we're still going to be here. And we're going to complain. We're going to do whatever we need to do. Uh, we'll just say it, protest, demonstrate, occupy, do whatever we need to do to make sure that our issues stay in the front of the live line. It's a life and death situation, and I appreciate it, and thank you very much for asking that question and those comments. Let me just... Let me piggyback on what Richard has said and by saying this too shall pass. Um, and on the IWG, I remember back in the days when Charles was trying to put together his vision within the federal government and ran the IWG, and there might have been three or four of us sitting at the table with Charles. And last year we had like over 100 people from agencies when they discovered that, oh, this is real secretaries, departmental secretaries, deputies. Now we got into transition things, you know, people disappear. But um, my point simply is we've been through these troughs before. And forget about the federal government. I mean, everybody needs the money, and I know there'll be programs for suffering. But environmental justice, as Charles has said, is here to stay, okay? And one of the reasons I used to talk to Charles when we worry about these troughs, I said, do you know how many people you've trained and brought into the, an understanding of environmental justice in the federal government alone? These people are all going to be promoted in, in their careers to be in positions of power and their hands on the purse. The influence of the last 10 years plus have influenced people that, as I said, this too shall pass, and it's like been a big pruning. It's not dead and you may be cut back. Um, and environmental justice, this is not some new, new thing you've just discovered. It's people like Richard and Charles. I mean, they talk, they, you heard him talking about terms of 30 years, okay? It's longer than that in some places. This has been a long time coming, and we're not done yet. And the question is, do you want to be part of it? Whether you're a lawyer, or a grassroots person, if you're nine or 90. There's a question, but uh, there's still work to be done. Um, another question? Does that? Yes. You are whom? Oh, thank you so much. Um, a nonprofit that Who are I. You? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Margaret Shugart. I'm a first year student. Um, I'm also on the board of a uh, nonprofit called the Big Bend Conservation Alliance. We're focused on far west Texas. Um, down near the Big Bend National Park. Um, and in that nonprofit, we're facing a new fracking play near our community. Community is primarily low socioeconomic, primarily Latino. Um, and this particular area is, uh, relies on tourism for a spring-fed pool and also dark skies um, for an observatory. And the fracking play threatens all of that um, uh, probably permanently. Um, but I was very inspired by listening to Randy particularly talking about sitting down at a round table uh, with the, the company. And they, they seem to be open to having dialogue about how to be a better neighbor and how to be um, a participant in solutions, or at least mitigation, on this community. So I was wondering, um, Randy and, and anyone else, if you have a question or two that may be good to ask at that mediation or at that round table that can inspire conversation with them. Um, to open up more possibilities for solutions. I think one question that you want to ask is, do you really know this community? Because it really comes down to breaking the mold, okay? And the mold is, again, if, if you look at corporations the way they were when I was a kid, or you know, where you, you looked, it was older white males in charge and just it was on the, on the ivory hill and you didn't question them. Uh, they didn't have to report to anybody and all. But your question is, if they're gonna come down and talk to you, then you wanna know, do you truly understand the problems we're facing? Do you understand, and really the question might be, do you understand why we're angry? You know, and they may give you three reasons and you might say, you know what, it's not even those three. Those make us upset. This is the one that makes us angry. And so that's what you want to do. You want to humanize it. Because it's not academic. 
It's not political. I mean, it, it morphs into those arenas, and those are the avenues that you have to, to have to drive down. But ultimately, it's people, and you have to get them to understand. Do they understand the issues that you're facing and how this affects the human beings that live there? Now, what they're going to understand in the back of the mind, because one thing I didn't tell you about my background, I used to be a little bit in the media. And the other thing in the back of their mind, especially now, as I said, in 2017 with, with technology, they want to appear that they are addressing those human needs. And they may sincerely wish to. That's to your advantage. Um, I might have missed something when you were when you were introducing yourself, but this may be an example of what I'm talking about, divorcing environmental justice from environmentalism. Now, I'm not sure that I heard the environmental justice issue with your community, and I'm not denigrating at all the importance of what you're talking about, because I think what you raised is very important. But just to make a point, um, it seems to me it was more like there were environmental issues which affect communities in general. But remember, environmental justice is talking about communities of color, poor people, and poor people in general. So unless I heard that correctly, it was more like an environmental problem, which again is not to say to denigrate it at all, but I just want to make a point. Well, it's that it affects, it affects their income potential. So pretty much 87 uh, percent of the income in the area is from tourism mm -hmm. and this fracking play threatens to pull pretty much all the groundwater out and to destroy dark skies um, and there's a mcdonald observatory is out there one of the top five mm -hmm. observatories in the world and they've only dropped seven wells they're planning on well over a thousand and we've lost five percent of our dark sky capability already and much of that community relies on those two resources for for their way of life, um, in addition to benzene and methane release and all of the other issues that environmental damage causes for human beings. Well, good um, that you at least understand about the difference of it, and I, I accept that. <laughs> Let me uh, piggyback on his recommendation and his, uh, that um, my non-emotional friend Richard uh, has been known upon occasion to raise pure bloody hell uh, in the media and other places. But Richard is one of the preeminent people of knowing the time to sit down and talk. And you do so. One thing he demands, in, and I've seen him do this time and time again, is respect for everybody at the table, including, yeah. if you will, the enemy, or in this case, the business people. You have to talk in a respectful way. That doesn't mean that you're a wussy, and that you want to make sure they know that you 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 are there for the, the duration. But you know you don't go about talking to anybody, anybody's mama, and you don't start using talking out, calling outside their name. You know you were raised right. You know how to be polite. Polite does not mean don't be firm, but you cannot have discord or solve a problem by calling people's name. Is that fair, Brother Richard? No, I think it is, and I think it's a very, very important uh, question. I wanted to thank Randy for, for his, also for his comments and for his presentation. It's very, very important for us as grassroots that we come to the table. Um, there's no question about that. Um, and so how do we, how do we, some of the examples that uh, Randy's given is actually in some respects, uh, some of those representatives have been on NEJAC councils and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's why I just bring back the NEJAC and the role that the NEJAC has played. Uh, because even in that reference to your question, uh, when, we come to, when we come to the table as the NEJAC Council, we come to the table equally, and that's what, uh, that's what Quentin's uh, referring to. Now, that, re that has to be put in place uh, by the chair just to make sure that that moral and, and political authority is put on in that table. Uh, but I'm also one of the mentors to many of our youth, uh, one of the men mentors, and we have women mentors, um, that are to our youth in terms of coming to the negotiating table, no? um, and uh, and some of the points that's necessary to get there. But uh, we've we've done some. I mean, we still get calls this many years from some industry and business folk, uh, just saying, "Look, we we really want to try to do the right thing here. Um, can we talk about it at least?" And so we played a role in kind of doing that too, off the record, non knee jack, just much of the work that we've been. All right, who's going to be, oh, Charles? 
You know, um, that's a that's a great question, and just to build on what Randy and Richard said, you know, I've had countless conversations with um, people from business and industry, and um, and I always go into um, these conversations, you know, with um, an open mind and you know a, a desire for real real meaningful conversation, and you know, the, the I mean, I think the first thing that you should ask is, are they, you know. If you wanted to reach out and make sure that you're hearing from people that are affected, are you reaching the right people? You know, and I know that in, in many cases, you know, there are uh, structures set up like community advisory boards and things like that. But, you know, this, there's always this question of whether or not you're really reaching the right people, you know. Um, so that's, that's one of the uh, things that I think you could be asking. The other is that um, you can bring a lot of tools that are out there to help inform the conversation because part of the problems of um, uh, the or the issues that relate to environmental justice is the is the ability for communities uh, who have less capacity to you know to bring to to be made aware right or to bring these um, issues um, uh, to the table so you know um, you know there are tools like um, EJ screen that is on the website you know that you can look and see the town of environmental and, um, and and demographics related to a particular areas um, there's lots of other kinds of information that you can help you know, bring to the conversation. Um, negotiated with our handlers for one last question. And who's the luck? I think the gentleman back there. But we're going to invite you to grab any of these panelists at any time during the conference and ask them a question. You, you and I will talk. So, if you, but I, you want to talk? Well, you don't want me. Oh, you can have. Him. But uh, he had his hand up for some time. So. So, I, my name is Joe Strain. I'm a first year law student here. Uh, one of the issues that's really stuck out to me throughout the course of this panel is the somewhat, lap, the somewhat limited application of uh, our current environmental laws to environmental justice. So my question for the panel in general is, if you had your dream piece of legislation to help handle these issues, what would it look like and how would it be implemented? First year law student, huh? So let me um, let me kind of go go to that, and I think you hit on a really important point. I didn't really have time to speak to it, you know, in terms of the body of work that was produced in the last eight years, and you know, um, I will go back to the the executive order, um, you know, point, said that there's um, the, every federal agency shall address, uh, identify, and address as appropriate. Uh, disproportionately high and adverse environmental and and public and health effects of this, so on and so forth, right? Um, and um, but it never tells you how to do it, right? So uh, what just as important as the document is the one that um, is the memorandum that President Clinton issued at the same time. Uh, so there's a strange political, you know, conversation that went behind that, but. Um, so what President Clinton said was that um, federal agencies should um, use existing environmental and civil rights statutes. You know, now it took a long time, and a, this is a torturous conversation. But one of the most important documents that came out in 2010 was this EJ Legal Tools Compendium, mm -hmm. which um, identified all the authorities. Um, not all, many of the authorities under the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, you know, the Ep uh, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, you know, um, the, the, um, the right to know laws, so on and so forth, that um, can be applied, can, that can be used, right? You know, arguably speaking, if you had no executive order, the federal agency should be using those laws to the full extent of, you know, uh, and addressing um, uh, the impacts on the most uh, at-risk populations, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so those are important things to really start to look at as the grounding for this, for this discussion. Um, and, um, and so um, 
Um, so I just stop there because this is a longer conversation, but you hit on a really, really, really important point. Um, you know, the other side of this, let me just say, is that there are civil rights statutes. Mm -hmm. You know, that needs to be fully, um, you know, looked at. And, uh, and that's another long conversation. But again, you hit on a really, really important point. And you can find all of this online. Um, and, uh, and if after you've proven yourself in your first year, you can come down to Howard and take my course in environmental justice or by the, or then the course here at the school. Um, it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, it is, remember, there is no environmental justice law. There are all of these other federal laws, and it doesn't matter. What matters is do you use what's already there? It, it's all in the statutes that are available, as Charles was kind of alluding to. Is there the political will to use them accordingly? And that's a whole different conversation. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. I thank you for your attendance. I encourage, I will say one, there's one particular, all of the, the sessions this afternoon are absolutely important. You must see all of them. But there's one, it'll be during the, um, the lunch uh, period. Uh, uh, Representative Harold Mitchell from uh, South Carolina is going to be making a presentation and a, uh, what do you call it? What do you call this thing? PowerPoint, thank you very much. Uh, which is truly impressive um, and you should make it a point to see that particular one. But I hope to see you around during the rest of the conference. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you again to our wonderful panelists. Um, I'll invite you to sit back down just so I can give you a few about what is about to happen. So um, I want to make a quick point um, that Professor Pear made last night, um, that it's incredibly rare and unique that we have all of these individuals in one room, in one building here in rural Vermont. Um, so please take advantage of it. Um, there are a lot of great experts in the room today. So um, next is our first round of breakout sessions. And I think that our panelists gave us a lot to, thought, to think about and our, the background in environmental justice, but now it's time to really come up with the solutions that we want to see implemented. So to do that, we have wonderful student leaders that are going to bring you or lead you to the breakout session rooms. And I'm gonna read them in a moment, so get ready with a pen and paper, or if you have one of the sheets, that's fine too. Um, but before I read them, I just want you to know that we are gonna give you a few minutes to take a break, use the restroom, grab additional food, um, and then make your way over to those rooms. And la the last thing I wanna say before I announce the rooms is that Dean Mahali asked me to remind everyone that it is snowing outside. Um, Particularly if you are not from the area, um, use care when driving um, and reach out to those around you if you have concerns about that for how to get around Vermont. So without further ado, here are the rooms for the breakout sessions. The Food Deserts and Sustainable Agriculture session is in Oaks 107. And Danny Folds and Renee Smith will lead you there if you want someone to guide you and find it, but there will also be a bunch of students out to help you. So that's Oaks 107. The Puerto Rico, the Flint of the Caribbean is in Oaks 210. Um, and I don't know if any of our student leaders are in the room because they're preparing, but if you head that way, we'll point you in the right direction. So that's Oaks 210. The um, Addressing Barriers to Renewable Energy is in Oaks 110. Jack. Wadley and Liz Doherty can lead you there, Oaks 110. Women, Families, and Environmental Justice is in the map room, also again, that way. I'll be heading there so you can follow me. Um, grassroots Organizing for Environmental Justice is in Oaks 211. All of those rooms are out this way and you can ask any friendly student to point you in the right direction if you get lost. 